この場で確実に殺しておかねばならん貴様は危険な存在だ<笑>使わねばならんとはなんとも情け消したれ希望何今のなぜだどういうことだもうダメじゃないでしょ<笑>今日よな Welcome to Peach Boy Riverside. Get ready to delve into a journey filled with beautiful monster women and epic fight scenes. Episode 1, we are introduced to a perplexing scenario as a mysterious girl encounters a half human lying unconscious on the ground. Suddenly, the half human stomach growls, causing the girl to realize that she must give it something to eat. Not sure what to offer, she settles on a carrot since the demi human looks like a rabbit. As the conversation between the girl and the half human progresses, the girl suddenly reveals her name, Salthorine, which she prefers to be called Sally. As Sally continues to speak, she reveals that she has a princess order for the half human. However, she quickly clarifies that she is no longer a princess. Sally then proceeds. To ask the half human if she can communicate in the human language. The girl replies that she can try, and upon further inquiry, reveals her name to be Frau. Intrigued by Frau's appearance, Sally asks her if she is a monster or something. Frau responds confidently, stating that she is not a monster, but rather a hair folk. Sally, curious about what a hair folk is, realizes that it must be a demi human. As the conversation continues, Sally recalls hearing stories of non human creatures living in the forest. As Sally walks down the path, she can't help but notice Frau trailing behind her. She wonders if the demi human has nowhere else to go, or if there's something else driving her curious behavior. Suddenly, Frau makes her intentions clear. She's decided to join Sally on her adventures until she's repaid her debt for the carrot. Sally isn't entirely thrilled with the idea of traveling with a demi human, but decides to make the best of the situation. As they journey on, Sally expresses her concerns about the challenges they may face while traveling together. She warns Frau that they could easily get separated in the upcoming village, as humans may not be comfortable with demi humans. Later, they decide to make their way into the city. They move quickly and quietly, their hearts pounding with excitement and anticipation. As they make their way towards the inn, they run into another man who seems curious about their presence. I've never seen you two around here before. Are you travelers? he asks, his eyes studying them carefully. The two women exchange a look, surprised that they're being asked the same question again. They wonder if this is a common occurrence in this village. To their surprise, the gentleman responds kindly, inviting them to his mansion for a delicious dinner. The trio eagerly accepts, enjoying a lavish meal in the luxurious estate as the gentleman reveals himself as the local lord, offering them the best hospitality. The next day, Frau's bravery is put to the test as she confronts a menacing monster determined to devour the innocent villagers. With her impressive strength and cunning tactics, she emerges victorious. However, to her dismay, the humans she saved are not grateful and instead ask her to leave their town. As the episode comes to a close, Sally unleashes her newfound powers to show off her skills in front of a cocky monster. At the beginning of episode 2, we are transported to a tranquil setting where a mysterious girl with purple hair is enjoying the shade of a tree. She ponders aloud about a certain set and whether he's having the time of his life. Suddenly, she hears a voice and realizes that she is not alone. However, her powers fail to detect the presence of the person behind her. Undeterred, she decides to play with the human and pass time. With a piercing red eyed gaze, she reveals that her companion has left her and life has become dull. As the guy swings his sword with ease, he splits the tree in half, leaving the girl awestruck. Suddenly, he speaks up, revealing that he's on the hunt for a worthy adversary to play with. The girl, taken aback by his raw power, wonders who this mysterious stranger could be. Without hesitation, the guy proposes a challenge. They'll wait just five minutes for the girl to fully regenerate before testing each other's strength. As the clock ticks down, the tension between them grows, and they engage in small talk to pass the time. 
Meanwhile, Sally faces off against a monstrous sea lion, using her magical powers to slice off one of its powerful arms. The sea lion commends Sally for her impressive fighting skills and expresses excitement at the prospect of taking on two powerful opponents at once. Meanwhile, Frau lies unconscious near the wall and Sally valiantly stands guard to protect her. As the sea lion attempts to strike Sally with a hammer fist, she expertly blocks the attack with the tip of her finger. The sea lion is taken aback, realizing that this human is unlike any other he has encountered. He pulls back his fist, perplexed by the incredible power possessed by a non-demi-human. Meanwhile, in the forest, the strange guy and girl continue their conversation, passing the time as they wait for five minutes. As the girl approaches, she inquires if he is the legendary monster slayer making waves throughout the town. Eager to share his travels, the traveler confirms he's been journeying far and wide, slaying ogres and monsters along the way. The girl expresses her admiration for his prowess, mentioning that her own powers have recently been restored. As she rises to her feet, she reflects on her love for nature and the cattle that roam her land. Unbeknownst to the boy, the girl has grown into a teenager since their first encounter, standing tall and confident in her revenge against those who stole her precious land. As the boy comes to the sudden realization that humans and monsters are at odds due to their mutual animosity, they both lock eyes and prepare for battle. Just as tension mounts between them, the girl interrupts, informing them that five minutes have elapsed. Suddenly, she declares that the boy is too dangerous to be left alive and must be eliminated immediately. Unfazed, the boy challenges her to give it her best shot. Who will win this battle? Before we find out, take a moment to answer the question of the day. Who has the most overpowered ability in anime? Comment down below for a chance to be shouted out. As the boy slices through the girl, she suddenly disappears into thin air and reappears behind him unscathed. Astonished by her mythical abilities, the girl reveals that she has harnessed the power of Zhen Dao, a technique that merges one's inner energy with the natural world. The boy is taken aback, impressed that a mere high ogre could master such a complex skill. The boy states his objective as slaying the ogres and expresses his belief that he will be happy once he achieves it. The girl senses the overwhelming hostility in the air and dispatches one of her eyeballs to fetch reinforcements. Concerned about the girl's survival, the boy questions whether she'll make it until backup arrives. She reassures him that her Zhen Dao will provide ample protection. Growing restless, the boy swiftly eliminates all the eyeballs using his key. Meanwhile, the sea lion is enraged, who is struggling to defeat a Sally, a woman rather than a man. The sea -less set grumbles that he was forced to fire his cannon by Sally, but suddenly he is taken aback when he sees Sally emerge, yawning from the blast. He can't fathom how she survived the powerful blow. Sally brushes it off, commenting casually that she just heard a boom. As Frau wakes up, Set can't help but wonder why Sally isn't even scratched. The boy had defeated the girl, but decided against killing her and instead went on a mission to find Sally. With just one swift slash, Sally had beaten Set in a duel. Later on, Sally and Frau come across the girl who had fought with the swordsman they were searching for. They realize that the purple-haired girl's name is Carrot, but they are unaware of her involvement with the boy. In an effort to help her, they all escape together. At the start of episode 3, we cut to a fallen man on the ground as the referee declares the match over. It seems that Hawthorne Grather has just defeated a knight in a fierce competition. Frau, Sally, and Carrot offer their congratulations to Hawthorne on his first victory, and he modestly reminds them of his impressive feats during the battle. As night falls, an ogre knight apologizes to the boss for failing to capture Hatsuki. Nevertheless, the boss reassures him that it's not a cause for concern since Hatsuki is a formidable opponent. As we move on to another scene, we find ourselves witnessing the god of mask, Joseline, being carried by an ogre knight towards a summoning circle. With excitement in her voice, Joseline compliments the color yellow for its crucial role in keeping the magic circle alive. Suddenly, the boss, Sumeragi, steps forward and reveals their plan to gather a hundred ogres. As we continue to watch, the ogres keep pouring out of the magical ring, and Sumeragi takes charge by giving orders to the army of ogres. 
he declares the commencement of the 672nd Hundred Ogre Gathering. With a sweep of his hand, he presents a map of the continent, highlighting the areas of influence for the ogres. To their surprise, the color red that signifies their dominance is rapidly dwindling, taken over by none other than humankind. The ogres question if the work of Peach Boy is responsible for their losses. Confirming his suspicions, the boss delves into the details of the upcoming Hundred Ogre Gathering. The curious ogre turns to Sumeragi, the boss, for more information about Peach Boy. It is then that Sumeragi's men realize the shocking truth. Mikoto is the legendary Peach Boy. Sumeragi's revelation shocks the ogres as they had underestimated the strength of a lone human. Despite their initial disbelief, they are forced to acknowledge Peach Boy's incredible power after learning he single-handedly defeated their entire army and even killed their leader, Moki. The following day, Sumeragi has a meeting with Sally and Mikoto. Sumeragi invites Sally to join him, but this suggestion does not sit well with Mikoto, who becomes visibly angry. Sally is presented with a choice. Who will she choose? <laughs> As episode 4 begins, a flashback takes us back to a time when monsters roamed freely on the western continent. Humans were constantly living in fear and constructed towering castle walls to protect themselves from monstrous threats. They tirelessly trained warriors to defend their land, but the monsters' powers were too strong and they decimated everything in their path. Despite their efforts, no human could stand up to the demons until a fateful day when a traveler arrived. As the traveler entered a town, they stumbled upon a group of knights pursuing a young lady, the princess, and demanding that she return to the royal palace. The determined lady declines the offer to head to the royal palace, opting instead to explore the world outside and embark on an exciting journey. Just as she sets off, fate intervenes and she crosses paths with a fellow traveler. The princess. The princess pleads for assistance, revealing that she is being pursued by dangerous villains. Without hesitation, the kind-hearted traveler agrees to lend a helping hand and offers to hide the princess from harm's way. The knights, hot on the princess's trail, soon catch up and demand her return. Quick-witted and resourceful, the traveler deceives the knights by misleading them with false information, claiming that the princess has gone in the opposite direction. As the princess gazes at the traveler, she curiously asks for his name. With a warm smile, he introduces himself as Mikoto. In turn, the princess reveals her identity as Saltarine Alderake, but prefers to go by Sally. Mikoto's eyes widen in surprise as he realizes he's in the presence of royalty. Eager to spend more time together, they venture to a nearby bakery. As they enjoy their treats, a kind lady notices the princess and reminds her of her age to settle down and consider marriage. Sally asks Mikoto to stay in the castle since it is getting late and they will talk about his journey tomorrow. As the two converse, they are unaware of the two ogres lurking in the shadows, intently observing their every move. Suddenly, the ogres erupt in anger and frustration upon realizing that the person standing before them is none other than the infamous Peach Boy. As Sally steps into Mikoto's room one morning, she is taken aback by Mikoto's flat chest. Mikoto explains that he is, in fact, a man, and Sally realizes she had mistaken him for a woman. Curious, Sally asks Mikoto to share why he's more beautiful than she is, even though he's a man. The conversation leads to a tumble, and Sally can't help but feel embarrassed when her sheet grazes Mikoto's face. After the awkward moment, the two set out together. Sally asks Mikoto to take her with him, but he hesitates, citing the dangers of his journeys. Just then, an ogre suddenly appears inside the castle, announcing that he has come to rule the kingdom. The old geezer ogre strides into the king's court and declares his intention to trade. However, there is a sinister catch. He demands that 30 people be sacrificed to him every month to spare the kingdom from his wrath. Despite the guards' attempts to defend their land, the ogre swiftly decapitates one of them with his bare hands. He leaves, warning the king to provide him with a response. As the ogre contemplates his plan, he suddenly hears about the legendary Peach Boy and 
and realizes he must reconsider or face his demise. In a separate incident, Mikoto valiantly slays a group of ogres who dare to challenge him. Meanwhile, Sally announces to the king that she is embarking on a journey. Mikoto and Sally have finally reunited after being separated, and now they continue their adventures together. However, despite their friendship, they have different goals in mind. One night, a young lady walks alone in the dark, feeling uneasy as she hears footsteps behind her. Suddenly, she turns around and is surprised to see a cat walking behind her. She scolds the cat for scaring her, but as she turns back around, she comes face to face with a vampire who sinks his teeth into her skin. As the night falls, the girl suddenly collapses with a distinct tooth mark on her neck. The next morning, Hawthorne takes a walk with Sally, Carrot, and Frau, and shares his chilling encounter with vampires. Sally dismisses the idea, claiming that vampires are nothing but ancient folklore. However, Hawthorne insists that they are real and lurking in the shadows. Kara becomes more intrigued and starts to believe Hawthorne's story. Hawthorne then reveals that he heard about vampires from a guard at the checkpoint while registering for a fight. The guard had found corpses scattered around the town in the past few days, hinting at the presence of these blood-sucking creatures. As the two arrive at the town, they notice something strange about the corpses lying around. Clearly, the blood has been drained from them. It's apparent that they all have two puncture marks on their necks, suggesting that a vampire could be responsible. Sally suggests that they camp outside the city instead of venturing inside. Hawthorne tries to reassure her that they will be fine, but Sally is not convinced. She punches him when he says that the vampires only go after beautiful women, which means she wouldn't qualify as a target. Meanwhile, Carrot senses a strange feeling as she gazes at the town. As Sally and the crew enter the town, they prioritize finding an inn. However, they quickly realize that they are the talk of the town, with curious citizens wondering why demi-humans are associating with humans. Unfortunately, this gossip soon turns into something more sinister, as the townspeople decide to report the group to the guards. Sally, understandably angered by the unjust treatment of her companions, feels compelled to confront the town's residents. However, Hawthorne advises her to let it go and move on. Sally can't help but wonder why these individuals are mocking demi-humans who pose no threat to humans. Hawthorne informs Sally about the hostile environment towards demi-humans in the region, emphasizing the prevalent discrimination. Sally suggests they proceed, but Carrot proposes punishing the humans for mocking her and Frau. Sally disagrees with Carrot's idea, stating that using their powers against humans is not appropriate. Carrot questions why Sally can't use her powers against humans while sparing her own kind despite killing ogres. Hawthorne locates an inn and directs them to go there. As they come to the realization that the inn has strict rules forbidding any demi-humans from entering, Sally urges Hawthorne to convince the humans otherwise. But as Hawthorne assesses the situation, he knows that it's unlikely to work, prompting him to come up with a different plan. Frau will sneak in later. However, Sally expresses her concern about Frau being alone until nightfall and the difficulty of getting her into the inn unnoticed. Despite Sally's worries, Frau reassures her that she's okay with being on her own for a while. With that settled, they part ways and Frau sets off to buy things alone. As the evening wears on, Carrot meets with Kyu Katsuki, the imposing high ogre. Without hesitation, she commands him to decimate the human population of the city. But before things escalate further, Frau appears and urges Kara to follow her. Kyuketsuki labels her a hair folk, and the two engage in an intense battle. Just as things seem dire, Sally bursts onto the scene, ready to take down the formidable Kyuketsuki. After a heated fight, she discovers his true identity as a vampire and emerges victorious. As Kyuketsuki lays defeated, he reveals a startling truth. Carrot is actually the legendary Meki, and he proceeds to recount the past that led to this moment. Sally, Carrot, Frau, and Hawthorne embark on a journey to a kingdom that holds a deep-seated hatred for demi-humans. As they reach their destination, Kara becomes increasingly agitated by the human's taunts directed toward her kind. Fueled by her anger, she seeks out Kyuketsuki, a powerful vampire, to teach the humans a lesson. However, things take an unexpected turn and Kyuketsuki ends up facing off against Frau. Sally soon joins the fray and together they emerge victorious. Kyuketsuki reveals his reasons for despising humans, which deeply resonates with Frau. 
During the fight, dark black wings come out of Frau's back. The next day, Frau awakens to a surprising sight. She has sprouted black wings. As she tries to make sense of this new development, Alta appears at her bedside with a mysterious ring hovering above her head. As Frau opens her eyes, she sees Angel Alta standing above her. Suddenly, she realizes that she has died once again, but Alta quickly reassures her that she is not in the afterlife, but in the worldly realm. Frau is surprised to hear that Alta has been watching over her since she arrived in this new world. Alta goes on to explain that after the battle, Frau had lost consciousness and her friends had brought her here to rest. As they wait for her to recover, two of her companions have gone to the city to fetch carrots for her. Meanwhile, the swordsman is keeping a watchful eye on the door, making sure that no humans disturb Frau's peace. Frau expresses gratitude towards Alta's counsel and acknowledges the loyalty of her kind-hearted friends, who haven't deserted her despite her demi-human status. Alta cautions Frau that if she remains in her current form, she will not be able to survive for long in the mortal realm. Frau agrees to use Alta's magic to conceal her powers, as she feels her demonic form is on the verge of dominating her body. Just then, Hawthorne appears in the room, having overheard their conversation, but finds it empty. As Hawthorne peers into the room, he can't believe his eyes. He thinks he must be imagining things because there's no one there except for Frau, who is sound asleep. But then he notices something remarkable. Frau has returned to her normal demi-human form, and he feels relieved that she's back to her old self. Unbeknownst to Hawthorne, Alta is perched on the rooftop, eavesdropping on his conversation with Frau. Even though Frau is feigning slumber, Alta can tell that something is amiss. As if on cue, Sally and Carrot arrive in town, eager to help. Carrot suggests they focus on finding medicine rather than carrots this time, as they left Frau in a terrible state. Sally mentions the walrus ogre and assures everyone that Frau will recover. Later, Sally and Carrot go out to buy carrots. We then cut to a flashback about how Mikoto met the blonde-haired Milia, an ogre capable of controlling her hair. At night, Mikoto becomes furious upon discovering that Milia is an ogre, but her talking dog immediately jumps in to defend her, arguing that she has no memory of being an ogre. Later, as the trio are walking toward the city, they are ambushed by the ogre knight. Milia suddenly remembers her roots and begins to unleash her hair power. However, she is defeated but removes her horn in order to get Mikoto to protect her. As the episode ends, she wakes up in a village room being taken care of by Mikoto. At the start of episode 7, we cut to a horrible scene. The crew is suddenly confronted with a devastating sight. Their beloved village was reduced to ashes. Carrot gazes back in shock, and as she processes the scene, a realization dawns on her. She knows the individual responsible for this destruction. Curious, Kara inquires if the beast Somenki was behind the attack. Sally and Frau quickly turn their heads, catching a glimpse of the menacing one-eyed creature with two horns. Sally directs her attention towards Somenki and boldly asks if he was the one who committed this heinous act. With a confident stride, Somenki steps forward and confesses that he was indeed involved in the destruction. However, he explains that others were sent before him and he was only helping out. Somenki goes on to explain the tragic demise of Set and how he is now next in line to finish the job. According to Samenki, he can't comprehend why it was so challenging to slaughter a single human kingdom, and he questions Kara if she has become human. This statement instantly infuriates Carrot, and she's ready to engage in a fight with Samenki. In response, Samenki challenges her to fight like she used to before mingling with humans. However, Carrot suddenly stops and realizes that living with humans has softened her heart. She's no longer the fierce fighter she used to be. Somenki points out that she can't die with dignity at his hands. As Carrot surrenders and offers herself up to Somenki, Sally steps in to interfere. Reminding Sally of Somenki's immense power, Carrot pleads with her to reconsider. But Sally, unfazed, simply rubs her head and assures Carrot that there's no need to worry. The two of them stand their ground, facing off against Somenki. Sally turns to Frau, seeking her advice on what to do next. 
Frau reminds Sally of her past triumphs, including her defeat of the walrus, and boldly declares that even Semenki is no match for her. But Sally, hoping to avoid a violent confrontation, denies having any interest in fighting. Semenki, however, finds the prospect of battle thrilling and teleports in to strike Sally. Just as he's about to attack, a mysterious voice stops him in his tracks. Semenki quickly realizes that it's Sumeragi, and Carrot fears that their worst nightmare has arrived. Sumenki so queries why he doesn't need to assassinate the human. Frau points out that the man is conversing with an ogre. Sumenki so reminds Sumeragi that their directive mandates the elimination of all humans in the region. However, Sumeragi grants an exemption for Sally. Sumenki so presses for an explanation of the repercussions of killing Princess Sally. Sumeragi so agrees to elucidate the matter and permits Sumenki so to teleport and return. Sumenki departs the battleground, leaving Kara to ponder the outcome if Sumeragi hadn't communicated with him. As morning breaks, Sally finds herself pondering why the perpetual conflict between monsters and humans persists. Hawthorne, still reeling from the destruction of his childhood village, remains in a state of shock. Sally recognizes their urgent need for sustenance, water, and weaponry, and suggests they press onward. The crew embarks on a journey, eventually arriving at a neighboring town where they secure lodging. It is here that they encounter Mikoto, prompting Sally to make a momentous decision, to embark on a mission to educate against prejudice. As evening descends, Sally meets with Sumeragi, who reminds her of the importance of Jean Dao and the need to embrace it fully. As episode 8 begins, we are brought back to Sally's difficult decision between Sumeragi and Mikoto. Both extend their hand towards Sally, leaving her uncertain of what to do. However, Sally knows that her ultimate objective is to end the ongoing conflict between humans and orcs. Without hesitation, she steps forward and chooses Mikoto as her companion. In that moment, Mikoto is taken aback as he realizes that it's his first time anyone has ever chosen him. Overwhelmed by the situation, he flees, and Sumeragi advises Sally to follow the path she had decided upon. Without second thoughts, Sally begins to pursue Mikoto. As Sally catches up with Mikoto, she takes a moment to explain her reasoning for choosing him. Mikoto, in turn, shares his deep-rooted disdain for the monsters who took his parents from him at a young age. He explains that avenging their debts is what brings him a sense of peace. Out of nowhere, the wall surrounding the country suddenly explodes, leaving the humans bewildered and unsure of what to do. As the dust settles, two massive monsters emerge, accompanied by a monstrous flying eagle. The ogre questions the boss, asking if they should eliminate the humans, but the boss simply brushes them off, stating that there's no need to waste their energy on such insignificant beings. Todoroki suggests that creating chaos will lure out the Peach Boy. Meanwhile, inside the arena, the knights inform everyone that the tournament has been cancelled due to ongoing attacks. As Hawthorne ventures out to investigate, he discovers that the culprits behind the explosion are on the same level as Set. To his surprise, Hawthorne meets Barsus, whom he had defeated in the first round of the tournament. Barsus is impressed with Hawthorne's strength, despite his slender build. Hawthorne shares that he never forgets his opponents, and the two begin walking together. Barsus admits to Hawthorne that he's on the hunt for the ogre bounty, motivated by his responsibility to provide for his family. However, Hawthorne cautions him against underestimating the strength of the ogres, reminding him that not all of them are easy prey for humans. Despite the warning, Barsus expresses his gratitude for Hawthorne's advice and praises him as a good-hearted person. With his mind set on returning to his family, Barsus begins to make his way back. But just as he's leaving, tragedy strikes. A bolt of lightning strikes him, and he is transformed into a statue of stone. In shock and confusion, Hawthorne wonders who could have been responsible for such a cruel act. Suddenly, Todoroki appears on the scene, informing Hawthorne that the attack was actually intended for two people, and that he had just narrowly escaped being hit himself. Todoroki then draws Hawthorne's attention to the figure standing before them, Peach Boy. Hawthorne is taken aback, wondering who this young boy could be. Todoroki makes a shocking revelation, announcing himself as the High Ogre, the nemesis of Peach Boy. Meanwhile, Carrot discovers that the notorious baddest trio has made their way into town, seeking out Peach Boy. In an attempt to protect their beloved hero, Hawthorne boldly decides to take on both Todoroki and Peach Boy. 
While on their quest, Mikoto stumbles upon Daminki, who is fast asleep. Overcome with fatigue, Mikoto too succumbs to slumber. With tensions running high, Todoroki becomes convinced that Hawthorne is, in fact, Peach Boy. As the battle rages on, Frau finds herself locked in combat with the formidable Basu, while Carrot engages in a fierce confrontation with Shinki. Meanwhile, Sally bravely faces off against Sumeragi, determined to protect her friends and loved ones. With the stakes at an all-time high, Carrot boldly confronts Basu, promising to defeat him and seek out Todoroki. Just as things seem to be at their bleakest, Winnie appears on the scene, blocking the killing blow and questioning whether or not Hawthorne is truly prepared to lay down his life. Episode 9 commences with a flashback to the past, where we are introduced to Hiko. While wandering in a village one day, Hiko encounters a talking dog, whom he generously feeds. The dog reveals that it deceives humans by pretending to be dead in exchange for food. Unfortunately, humans often see the dog as a sign of bad luck and attack it. Interestingly, Hiko admits that he too was fooled by the dog's ruse. Despite this, the two form a bond and agree to travel together, with the dog becoming Hiko's faithful companion. As the day progresses, they overhear some villagers discussing a nearby ogre that is known for devouring humans. As they arrive on the scene, they witness a horrific sight, a gigantic ogre munching on helpless humans. The loyal dog urges Hiko to flee, but his sense of duty compels him to confront the monster. Spotting a young boy about to become the ogre's next meal, Hiko grasps his sword tightly. Despite the dog's warning that sacrificing his life won't lead him to his parents, Hiko's determination intensifies and his eyes turn blue as he charges towards the beast. With a swift and powerful strike, he slays the ogre in a single blow. The stunned citizens marvel at the rare sight of a human defeating an ogre. Hiko humbly acknowledges their cheers, but also declares that he cannot abandon the people of his village, even as he continues his quest to find his long-lost parents. As Hiko faces off against the ogre, the massive beast taunts him, incredulous that a mere human would dare defy him. Undeterred, Hiko demands that the ogre halt his destruction. In a fit of rage, the ogre swings a massive punch towards Hiko, but to his surprise, Hiko manages to block it with just his bare hand. The ogre is stunned as Hiko reveals his true identity as the legendary Peach Boy, slicing the ogre's name in half with a single strike. The citizens, amazed by Hiko's overwhelming power, can't help but wonder where such a mere human could have obtained such incredible strength. Rumors quickly spread throughout the village of Peach Boy's heroic actions. As he rises up to protect his people from their enemies, the orcs, ogres, and other beasts, the villagers who had suffered greatly from ogre attacks turned to Hiko for help whenever trouble arose. Without hesitation, Hiko took on the task of defending his people and began to slay the attacking ogres. This newfound duty made Hiko abandon his search for his parents and instead focus on protecting everyone around him. With his loyal dog by his side, Hiko embarked on a journey to end the battle once and for all by assassinating the ogre leader on their island. After an intense battle, Hiko pierces his blade into the heart of the ogre leader, who then accepts defeat. Admitting that Hiko had beaten him, the leader surrenders and promises to never trouble humans again. With the ogres gone, the land is finally free, and Hiko becomes the hero who saved the day. As fate would have it, Hiko meets a young boy named Mikoto, whom he helps when the villagers attempt to kill him because of his horn. From then on, Hiko and Mikoto become like father and son. Tragically, Hiko's life is cut short when he is killed by the god of laws, but in his dying moments, he passes on his sword, peach boy title, and armband to Mikoto, who becomes the new hero. With Hiko's teachings and guidance, Mikoto confronts and defeats the God of Laws, starting his path as the savior of the land. At 
the start of episode 10, as the lightning-wielding ogre Todoroki prepares to strike with his lightning blade, he demands to know who the stranger is that dared to stand in his way. With a confident smirk, the lady introduces herself as Winnie, the witch of the western forest. Not wasting any time, Winnie reveals that she has come to aid Hawthorne in his battle against Todoroki by presenting him with a powerful sword once wielded by Frau. As Hawthorne hesitates, unsure of how to use the weapon, Winnie encourages him to find a way, assuring him that she'll be watching. Amidst the tension and anticipation, Hawthorne makes a bold declaration, telling Todoroki that he won't be defeated. With the powerful weapon in hand and Winnie's support behind him, Hawthorne prepares for the fight of his life. As Todoroki unleashes his lightning blade, he exudes confidence in its ability to shatter Hawthorne's sword. When he reveals the sword's name, Air, the treasure of heaven. Its reputation precedes it, even an ogre's flesh cannot withstand its cutting power. Todoroki acknowledges the sword's reputation, but asserts that merely wielding it does not automatically elevate him to Hawthorne's level. He emphasizes the superiority of his lightning sword over a metal one. Hawthorne, however, remains unconvinced until the Witch of the Western Forest confirms the sword's prowess. We then cut to the giant eagle. The latter thinks he has successfully smashed Frau and decides it's time to head to Todoroki's location. Just as he's about to make his escape, Frau miraculously wakes up, much to the eagle's surprise. Despite being hit by a cannon at close range, she's still breathing. Frau reveals that Alta had granted her new powers, and she jumps up to cut the eagle's wing. The vicious attack leaves the ogre stunned, and he can't help but acknowledge that Frau is no mere hare folk. In fact, it's a disgrace that he's of no use against her. Frau, fueled by her newfound strength, proceeds to cut off the eagle's head, but his body remains standing. After defeating her enemy, Frau falls unconscious. In the meantime, a heated battle between Carrot and Shinki erupts, with the latter reminding Carrot of the significance of a high ogre's horn. However, Shinki is relentless and bombards Carrot with slap attacks, even taunting her with her past name, Meki, and urging her to die. Carrot feels at a loss and ponders her next move, but she knows that the only way to defeat Shinki is to get closer and pierce his body. Despite Shinki's pursuit, Carrot manages to find herself at a dead end and comes to a stop. Shinki approaches her, questioning why she is attempting to flee. As Shinki remarks on Carrot's ill-fated encounter with the dead end, Carrot finds herself at a loss and knows that she must make her final move to knock out Shinki. Without hesitation, she employs Zhao Dao to blast him. Meanwhile, Sumeragi spares Saoli, realizing he has a soft spot for her. On another front, Hawthorne and Todoroki relentlessly exchange powerful blows. However, their confrontation takes an unexpected turn when Sally appears and convinces Todoroki to join forces with her. Despite the temporary peace, Sumeragi ultimately betrays Todoroki and stabs him in the back, leaving him to rot outside the castle walls. In the 11th episode, our beloved characters Hawthorne, Sally, Carrot, and Frau continue their journey and arrive at a new city after settling their scores with the High Ogre. As they approach a treehouse, Sally can't help but comment on how it resembles a witch's house, but Hawthorne assures them that they are heading in the right direction, and Sally is taken aback by the door's inscription of Bar. Despite their initial hesitation, the group steps inside. As they step inside, Sally's eyes widen in amazement. This bar is even more fantastic than she had imagined. Suddenly, a figure emerges from the shadows. It's none other than the witch from the western forest, Winnie, who greets them warmly. Sally can't believe her luck to be welcomed by such a renowned witch. Winnie remarks that it's been a while since she's had guests, and she's curious about the diverse group before her. There's a human, an ogre, and a hare folk. Sally can't help but wonder how Winnie knew about them, but the witch reveals that she's been observing them on her magical globe for quite some time. Feeling emboldened, Sally makes a bold request. She asks Winnie to teach her magic. To her delight, Winnie agrees. But before diving into the magical arts, Winnie decides to share the story of how they all came to be in this place. As Winnie sat in the library engrossed in her reading, she suddenly felt a surge of power wash over her, transporting her back in time. 
Upon arrival, she noticed a young boy in dire need of assistance, and with her magical abilities, she was able to save him. However, as she looked around, Winnie couldn't help but feel regret that she couldn't save more people. Just then, Hawthorne approached her, expressing his gratitude for her magical intervention that saved his soldier's life. Sally, curious about Winnie's powers, asked about the various types of magic she could perform. Winnie explained that there were many different spells at her disposal, including attack spells, transportation spells, and much more. To demonstrate, Winnie conjured a small flame in the palm of her hand, leaving Sally wide-eyed with excitement. Sally persists in asking Hawthorne to teach her magic, and Hawthorne can't help but wonder why Sally is so insistent. Sally explains that ever since she heard about witches, she's been intrigued. She confesses that she's not skilled with a sword like Frau, nor does she possess Frau's strength. Frau reminds Sally that she defeated the ogre, Set, but Sally can't seem to recall the victory. Meanwhile, Carrot is still struggling to come to terms with Sally's killing of her best friend and fellow walrus. Despite Carrot's reservations, they had no choice but to act in self-defense and leave the situation behind. During the clash, Sally must avoid death and fortunately, she manages to protect herself. After the altercation, Sally expresses her desire to learn magic so that she can continue her journey. Winnie, having witnessed Sally's humanity in her crystal ball, offers to teach her, but there are three conditions that Sally must meet. First, she must keep this a secret. Second, she must follow the rules. And third, she must pay three million. Sally is curious about the purpose of the three million, and Winnie clarifies that it is for payment. Winnie emphasizes that with the right mentor, anyone can learn magic. As Hawthorne interrupts, Winnie assures him that she will take any money he's offering. Sally, on the other hand, reminds Hawthorne that her worth is more than just currency. Nonetheless, Hawthorne reveals a stack of bills and reminds them that they need it for their travels. Sally then cleverly proposes that Hawthorne teaches her swordmanship in exchange for the cash. In no time, they make their way to the training grounds, and Sally begins honing her skills. Suddenly, they run into Milia, an ogre who wields her hair as a weapon. Meanwhile, Sumenki and Sumeragi meet up with the seasoned monster hunter, Mikoto. As all of our heroes gather for the final battle, things begin to get heated. Suddenly, the evil tree seizes Sally and tells her that ogres are actually created from human hatred. As the tree continues to talk about how peace can never be achieved, our heroes are engaged in a standoff with various ogres. Frau faces off with the hair ogre Milia as the peach boy Mikoto speaks with the ogre leader Sumeragi. Suddenly, Sally is overcome with rage and her right eye becomes the shape of a peach. She manages to blow apart the tree's grip on her as everyone stares in shock. As it turns out, Sally's power is a direct counter to the ogres and the tree tells her that as long as she is alive, there will be no peace. Suddenly, Milia attacks Sally but she easily breaks free and gut punches the ogre. She then turns her attention to the evil tree. Sally charges and manages to destroy the tree in one strike, ending the conflict. Later, we cut to our gang celebrating their victory. Meanwhile, however, Carrot's eye minion is conversing with Sumeragi, who has managed to survive the peach boy Mikoto. Once Sally wakes up, she enters the bar and her friends warmly greet her. Winnie offers to teach Sally magic, but Sally states that she has a new mission. Discover the true root of her power. With Peach Boy Riverside coming to an end, the last episode ends with Sally, Frau, and Hawthorne leaving to pursue their new quest. What a heartwarming way to end the series. Go check out more of our recaps and look forward to the next series coming soon.